The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Even a basic floating structure like a log raft with a piece of linen attached to a makeshift mast will sail before the wind if you know what you're doing. Now, sailing in other directions is a different story altogether, though. To sail in multiple directions, a boat must be designed and rigged so that the force of the wind moves it across the wind or into the wind, as well as moving it with the wind. This design and rigging process can be quite complicated, but luckily none of you will have to worry about that, as all our boats are primed for the off. What you guys need to focus on is controlling your direction and learning some of the basic manoeuvres. These two aspects of sailing will form the core of your training over the coming weeks on this course. Let's start with direction control. A boat with no means of control will travel straight downwind, no matter what direction it is pointing in. Using a rudder to counteract the wind's natural effect on the sail is the first step, therefore, in learning to control the direction you sail in. With a rudder, the bow of the boat can be pointed in any direction you desire. But we need more than just a rudder. Otherwise, there is nothing to stop the boat from sliding sideways when it is moving across the wind. That's where the keel or centreboard comes in. This will prevent any unwanted sideward movement. In our boats, we use a removable centreboard. Why? Because this enables them to sail in shallow waters. If your centreboard is fixed in place permanently, then your boat will ground when you encounter areas of water which aren't very deep. With the rudder for steering, and the centreboard to prevent sideward movement, your boat is now capable of travelling in numerous directions. Of the three basic sailing manoeuvres, which are 1. Sailing with the wind, 2. Sailing across the wind, and 3. Sailing into the wind, the latter of the three is by far the hardest. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Sailing into the wind is called tacking to windward. In reality, no boat can actually sail directly into the wind. If it does so, its sail will start to flap and become useless. That's where tacking comes in. Boats sail upwind by following a zigzag course. You can generally head to within 45 degrees of the wind direction before your sail starts to flap. And this is what we aim to do when we tack. Because the wind seldom blows with the same force and in the same direction consistently, 
Sailing into the wind requires great skill. Skilled sailors learn to sense the subtle changes in wind direction as they sail along and make minor adjustments for these. It will take you a lot of practice before you can do this effectively. Sailing across the wind is called reaching. Boats tend to clock their fastest speeds when reaching. Sailing with the wind is called running. But contrary to what people might expect, running is not as fast as reaching. This is because the sailor is not able to create his own wind resistance. How much resistance is created is entirely down to the strength of the wind which is pushing against the sail. This afternoon, we'll have our first practical lesson. You will get to know your boats on dry land first though, and we'll not be taking them out onto the water until tomorrow, and only then if weather permitting. Let's break for lunch now for half an hour or so, okay? That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2 First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 18. So, here we are in front of the entrance hall on the ground floor of this rather splendid 20th century building, once the home of Lord Redford of Graves, but which now, of course, has been converted into the National Art Museum. Now, look straight ahead towards the end of the entrance hallway to where it narrows. That door will take you into the main exhibition hall. Alternatively, if you take the first right, you'll come to the Modern Art section. And next to that is the Modern Art Studio, where you can see professional artists at work on their latest masterpieces. Fascinating! Taking a left off the entrance hallway, on the other hand, will lead you to the Classical Art section. If you look at the map on the entrance wall here, you will notice that there are two corridors running towards the back of the ground floor, one on the left and one on the right. They both lead onto the rear corridor, which is home to a further four exhibition rooms. On the far right, we have the landscape section. In the centre of the corridor is the still life section. And on the far left of the corridor, there are two rooms. As you walk down the corridor towards them, the one on your left is the history of art room. And the one opposite is the digital art room. Right, let's get started then, shall we? Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 19 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 19 to 20. Our first port of call will be the digital art room down at the end. This exhibition has been open little more than a month, but has proved hugely popular with visitors so far. It is an interactive exhibition space, and visitors are encouraged to touch and feel the exhibits to their heart's content. 
though of course I shouldn't need to remind you that this is forbidden in the rest of the museum, as is the use of cameras, so please ensure that you do not take any pictures once you leave the digital art room. That's the end of section 2. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. This is the main entrance. Let's go in. It's very big, isn't it? Yes, but here's a map which will help you. Can you see that it's a kind of L shape? Oh, yes. Is that the circulations desk in front of us? Yes. That's where all of the incoming and outgoing loans are registered. When you return a book, just put it in the large box over there. See it's marked returns? Just to the right of the desk. Yes, I see. Can I use the computers behind the desk to access the Internet? Those computers are for the library's database search system only. There are computers in the IT block which we passed on our way here to the library. Anyway, you can search for a book by typing in the title, author, topic, or a keyword. Are the computers easy to use? Yes, very easy. Even I can use them. Does it give a catalogue number after you do the search? Yes, it does. It'll also tell you in which section of the library to find the book. The library is divided into three sections. Straight ahead, behind the circulations desk, is the monograph collection. That just means you can borrow these materials for normal loans. Monograph collection? Yes. I see. The section behind the photocopiers is for all of the serial publications. That means journals and magazines and newspapers, of course. Mm -hmm. And the most important section for us is the reference section. You'll use it a lot. Unfortunately, the books in this section can't be borrowed. You have to use them in the library. It's over there, past the quiet study area. I see. So, do I need to join or register here? Or do I have automatic borrowing rights as a student? As long as you have your student card, you can borrow books from the monograph collection. Anyone else can access the rest of the library. What if I can't find a particular book? And that's what the staff are there for, Yumi. Just go to the advisor's desk. Take a request card and fill in the details of what you're looking for. Where's the advisor's desk? It's just over there. The desk at the entrance to the quiet study area. Right. Well, I think I'll have a look now to see if I can find any of the recommended texts for my first law assignment. Yes, good idea. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen 
and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, if you're going to work out at this gym, you'll need to think about your reasons for exercising. So let's consider that in more detail. Muscle mass is certainly popular with the guys, probably seeking to impress the girls, and with muscles comes the confidence to do that, right? Well, for that, you'll need our high-stress weight units, where pumping iron is all the rage. Moving on to other benefits, one of the main ones is beating the tension of life, right? And the longer the exercise is, the greater the rewards in this respect. Thus, playing squash can certainly help, and so can swimming. But what's much better, as every jogger will tell you, is their activity. So we have ample jogging machines and they're always popular. They can provide good fitness too, as can the yoga classes. However, again, let's not forget playing squash, which I would say is the optimum way to improve your general well-being. Such an active, energetic game, plus the competitive element, drives you forward into high levels of health and fitness. These, of course, are the ultimate purposes of being here, but remember, the centre is full of like-minded people, all of whom are interesting to meet and valuable sources of information. The yoga classes have a pre- and post-meeting session, so you'll certainly meet others there, although they'll all be yoga enthusiasts, which limits the range somewhat. But whether doing yoga, swimming or exercising, everyone showers, right? So those facilities are where you'll hear all sorts of interesting conversations and really get to know people. Not like the front desk area, which is mostly empty as patrons go immediately inside to do their exercise. Of course, the front desk can answer all your questions and has information brochures and such like, but for knowing more about a greater variety of subjects and community concerns, look at the notice board in the yoga studio, where there's a huge array of papers, leaflets and articles, all for you to read and consider. That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. I've been invited to talk about my research project into Australian Aboriginal rock paintings. The Australian Aborigines have recorded both real and symbolic images of their time on rock walls for many thousands of years. Throughout the long history of this tradition, new images have appeared and new painting styles have developed and these characteristics can be used to categorise the different artistic styles. Among these are what we call the dynamic, yam and modern styles of painting. One of the most significant characteristics of the different styles is the way that humans are depicted in the paintings. The more recent paintings show people in static poses, but the first human images to dominate rock art paintings over 8,000 years ago 
were full of movement. These paintings showed people hunting and cooking food, and so they were given the name dynamic to reflect this energy. It's quite amazing considering they were painted in such a simple stick-like form. In the Yam period, there was a movement away from stick figures to a more naturalistic shape. However, they didn't go as far as the modern style, which is known as X-ray because it actually makes a feature of the internal skeleton as well as the organs of animals and humans. The Yam style of painting got its name from the fact that it featured much curvier figures that actually resemble the vegetable called the yam, which is similar to a sweet potato. The modern paintings are interesting because they include paintings at the time of the first contact with European settlers. Aborigines managed to convey the idea of the settlers' clothing by simply painting the Europeans without any hands, indicating the habit of standing with their hands in their pockets. Size is another characteristic. The more recent images tend to be life-size or even larger, but the dynamic figures are painted in miniature. Aboriginal rock art also records the environmental changes that occurred over thousands of years. For example, we know from the dynamic paintings that over 8,000 years ago, Aborigines would have rarely eaten fish and sea levels were much lower at this time. In fact, Fish didn't start to appear in paintings until the Yam period, along with shells and other marine images. The paintings of the Yam tradition also suggest that, during this time, the Aborigines moved away from animals as their main food source and began including vegetables in their diet, as these feature prominently. Freshwater creatures didn't appear in the paintings until the modern period from 4,000 years ago. So these paintings have already taught us a lot. But one image that has always intrigued us is known as the Rainbow Serpent. The Rainbow Serpent, which is the focus of my most recent project, gets its name from its snake or serpent-like body and it first appeared in the Yam period four to 6,000 years ago. Many believe it is a curious mixture of kangaroo, snake and crocodile but we decided to study the rainbow serpent paintings to see if we could locate the animal that the very first painters based their image on. The Yam period coincided with the end of the last ice age. This brought about tremendous change in the environment, with the sea levels rising and creeping steadily inland. This flooded many familiar land features and also caused a great deal of disruption to traditional patterns of life, hunting in particular. New shores were formed and totally different creatures would have washed up onto the shores. We studied 107 paintings of the rainbow serpent and found that the one creature that matches it most closely was the ribboned pipefish, which is a type of seahorse. This sea creature would have been a totally unfamiliar sight in the inland regions where the image is found and it may have been the inspiration behind the early paintings. So... At the end of the Ice Age, there would have been enormous changes in animal and plant life. It's not surprising, then, that the Aborigines linked this abundance to the new creatures they witnessed. Even today, Aborigines see the rainbow serpent as a symbol of creation, which is understandable given the increase in vegetation and the new life forms that featured when the image first appeared. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.